most books that are out there on productivity, and I'll just say productivity, are, are either general personal productivity or they are written for a human being who doesn't have to stay connected and online all day yeah. long because that is their livelihood. And if you look at the older books, they do not take into account the digital world that we're in. And, and the reality is we are in the digital world. It is how we're living. It's how we're communicating. And it is having a much more profound impact on us than most of us actually realize. I mean, we just are, we just kind of slowly oozed our way into it. And I don't mean eased. I mean, we've oozed our way. It's like in every pore of our body, like you said, you know, it's in the bathroom with us. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez, Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Let me tell you, you guys are in for an amazing treat today. Today's guest on Selling with Social is Jill Conrath. Jill has over a quarter million LinkedIn followers and was recently named one of the top seven sales influencers of the 21st century. She's a speaker, she's an author, she's an amazing sales leader, and she's a friend. Her most recent book, More Sales, Less Time, was recently selected as one of 2016's top sales books. And let me tell you, after 19 years in the sales industry, this is definitely one of those books you'll want to pick up. She's also the author of Snap Selling, Agile Selling, and Selling to Big Companies. Make sure that you check out her numerous free resources at Jill Conrath, that's J-I-L-L-K-O-N-R-T-H dot com forward slash sales dash resources. Without any further ado, I want to welcome Jill Conrath to the show. Jill, my friend, thank you so much for joining me today on the Selling with Social podcast. Super excited to have you. I love the new book. Love. I love, love, love the new book. It, I, I literally feel like you're speaking to me. I'm in the room. You feel like you're reading to me when I'm reading this. It's fantastic. So thank you and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, spend this time talking with you today. I know our audience is very much going to benefit from all the things that you're going to be speaking about today with relation to productivity and how to gain more time back. But before we get into that, do me a favor. Tell our audience just a little bit about yourself. You, you are well known in the industry. And by the way, I didn't realize this. I was on a webinar with Jim Cathcart and I looked up the fact that he was part of the Sales and Marketing Hall of Fame. And I didn't realize that I had another friend in the Sales and Marketing Hall of Fame. <laughs> and that's you, Jill. So barring the famous Jill Conrad, tell us a little bit about yourself. Share with our audience who you are. Well, I don't really think of myself as a famous person. I just think of myself as a sales person. I mean, at my core, um, I started my sales career at Xerox, uh, then moved into selling technology after I sold technology. I discovered that people in that field love their stuff too much. And anybody who sells technology is really into what they're selling as opposed to the customer. And so I started a consulting practice working with technology companies primarily on how to launch new products effectively in the marketplace. And then about 10 years ago, I ended up writing my first book, which was Selling to Big Companies. That did like really well. And then I wrote my second book, which was Snap Selling. And then I wrote my third book, which was Agile Selling. And then I wrote my most recent one, More Sales, Less Time. And that's what we're here to talk about today is More Sales, Less Time. Before we get into some of the specifics about the book, do me a favor. What is one thing that nobody would know about you by looking just clearly at your social profiles? Give us, give us something that we don't know about you. Most people have no idea that I was a high school teacher before I went into sales. Ah, high school teacher. Okay. All right. Well, what did you teach? That's for you to guess. <laughs> I would say guess, econ, yeah. history, social studies. Nope. Nope. English? Nope. nope. Ah, geez, math. It's got to be, what, what is it, my friend? What is it? <laughs> 
that's one thing nobody knows about me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So you're going to keep that one. <laughs> but I was a high school teacher before. All right. I love it. Well, well great. Uh, you are definitely someone who I literally over my 19 year career have spent time watching, reading, following and now to have the privilege of being here with you and have this interview and spend some time talking to you about the book. First off, thank you. And I'm very honored to be here with you and to have actually learned techniques and concepts on selling and how to be better and grow myself as an individual is the name of the game in sales, right? Personal growth and personal development. So, and you are one of the masters at that. Thank you so much, dear. So uh, you just launched a new book, yes. More Sales, Less Time. So what inspired you to write more sales, less time? My miserable life is probably what inspired me to write the book. <laughs> I mean, I remember going to, um, flying to Ireland and just, I was out of touch with my computer the whole time, you know, and I'm flying there because I didn't sign on and I was just antsy. And, I, and then I started thinking how rattled my brain was and I, and I was just bouncing from here to there. And then I, I just was miserable. It was like I was working around the clock and I was hating my life. I was like, how did I get to this point in my career when I should be at the top of my game? And I'm more frazzled today than I have ever been in my whole life. I totally get what you're saying. I mean, literally wake up in the morning. Yeah. This is horrible to say. And I think I got to fix this problem, which is you wake up before anybody else ever wakes up, pick up the phone or whatever it is that's on your desk. And you're like, huh. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. I like, and, I, and, and I even check it for email before I go to bed night and I go to bed late at night, at like 11 30, 12 o'clock. I'm even checking it, you know, at that time to see if I have any messages. And like, no, but not that I would ever respond to anybody at that time because I wouldn't want them to think I was up thinking about business at midnight, but I just couldn't disconnect. And I felt this compulsive need to always be in touch and always be on. And I think that is a very familiar issue that almost every one of us that are connected in society, period, but especially those that are salespeople where we're actually waiting for communication to take place. We're extending reach to individuals. Like this is what we do. We're now like we're, we're totally mobily attached, mobile attached. I mean, like this thing is, this device right here is so connected to me. It, it should be just stuck to my hand. <laughs> you know, good to your ear too. You know, I mean, just, I mean, it's part of our livelihood. We have to be on the computer. We have to be on our cell phones. We have to be connected to our world because our customers are out there. We have to do the research that we need to do to find out about them. We have to go onto LinkedIn and see who they know and what we can find out and who they're connected to. And if we can find ways to get them and who else we should know in their organization. And I mean, it's like, oh, it's yeah. exhausting. Yeah, it's funny. I talk about this in some of the keynotes that I give and I ask everybody to raise their hand in the audience. And I said, I'm going to ask them a very embarrassing question. And I want you to answer this truthfully because I already know what the answer is. But everybody in the audience and those that are, that are listening now, right now to the show, I want you to answer this question to yourself. I'm raising my iPhone up here. And how many of us take this thing to the bathroom with us? <laughs> Yes. It is, it is like, really? I'm like, like we've, we've gone to the whole new level, but the reality is, is our buyers are doing it too. So, but, but it's, it's very difficult. This is a, a very difficult issue in terms of being totally connected and also getting this, this real high, if you would, on this beep and this click and this buzz that's coming through. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, because I loved how you broke that down inside of the book, More Sales, Less Time. So a little bit about this book. There's lots of sales books that are out there. What makes this book specifically different from all the other sales books that are available out there and or available on this particular topic? Or are there any other books about sales productivity? Most books that are out there on productivity, and I'll just say productivity, are, are either general personal productivity or they are written for a human being who doesn't have to stay connected and online all day yeah. long because that is their livelihood. And if you look at the older books, they do not take into account the digital world that we're in. And, and the reality is we are in the digital world. It is how we're living. It's how we're communicating. And it is having a much more profound impact on us than most of us actually realize. I mean, we just are, we just kind of slowly oozed our way into it. And I don't mean eased. I mean, we've oozed our way. It's like in every pore of our body, like you said, you know, it's in the bathroom with us. And so there's nothing that talks about that. When I really started to research this phenomenon that I was personally feeling about how frazzled, how I could get rid of this horrible feeling, I realized that it was the digital aspect of it that was the core of my problem. And, and until I was able to solve the digital issue, 
in a way that worked from a sales perspective that I couldn't even move forward. I mean, there's all these hacks out there, but it was beyond a hack. It was like my life was being run by my cell phone. Yeah, totally get that. And and waiting for the next buzz or waiting for the next ding or bing or whatever it is that you got on your phone. Uh, I was with somebody recently and they have customized uh, messaging set up for the different tools like email and text and LinkedIn and this. And one of them was that they set up for uh, every new LinkedIn message or notification they got was something to the effect of, hello, boss, you have a new message. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, then we, we've gone too far out in no. outer space with this issue here. Uh-huh. And if you think about it, we talk a lot about the digital age and how two-year-olds are growing up even with some of the electronic communication and devices. And it's true, they are. But even more recently, like we had to literally, this past weekend and over the last few days, we had to literally cut off all electronic uh, devices for our, my three-year-old and my six-year-old. It's just like they're, they're fiending for this, right? They're fiending for like this electronic communication and it's hard to break. So you open up in the book. I read this and I thought, oh my God, that's me, right? This, this, is, this is me. And I'm going to read this to you. It's, it's from More Sales Less Time. And this is actually, I think the setting, if I'm not mistaken, is a gentleman who saw you do a keynote at a specific sales event. He came up to you afterwards, after you gave uh, some, some advice on you know, how to be more successful. I forget what the, what the, what the keynote was. It was on my Snap Selling book, which is how to sell to crazy busy buyers. There and you go. How to sell to the busy buyer. And he opened up with, I'm totally maxed out right now. I hustled like crazy last year to meet my quota. Then they went and raised it 13% this year. Standard operating procedure, right? You, you excel and everybody raises it. Yeah. And then he says, I have no idea how I'm going to make my numbers. I'm up at the crack of dawn working my you know what off all day long. On my way home, I pick up my youngest at daycare. In the evening, I have family responsibilities and who doesn't, right? How in the world am I supposed to get everything done, learn our new CRM, do social selling, get research information? It was just like he, the list went on and on and on. And I sat back and I was like, oh my God, how do I do it? <laughs> you don't You honestly can't be at the top of your game if you're feeling like that. I mean, that's the reality that so many salespeople are feeling like that. And entrepreneurs too. Let me just say, it's not just salespeople. It's entre- anybody who's running their own company is feeling just as frazzled trying to do everything. But you're honestly not at the top of your game if that's how you're working. And that's what most of us don't realize, but it's consumed us. It's yeah. just consumed us. And I think obviously you, you wrote the book. You would agree that that picture that I just, I just read, that that scenario is totally wrong, totally out of place not only from a personal work-life balance, it's been flipped upside down, but from a pure, like, how do you get crap done? It's just wrong. It's just wrong, really wrong. I mean, it's so out of control that we are not living our life the way we want to live it. We're not doing our best job at work. Everything's in chaos. I think you mentioned that the stress that people feel you were talking about that, the stress and the anxiety that people feel of, like, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this. And how does that affect performance? The stress itself is reducing our performance because when you are feeling that extra burden, your brain is unable to think of more options. So here we are, entrepreneurs, salespeople trying to do our best. We need to be as savvy as we can for our customers. We need to come up with better strategies. We need to figure out new ways to deal with different things. And under stress, our brain shuts down. And so we are operating using the same trite ways that we've used before that maybe are not effective, but at least we know how to do them. And we're on this, you know, repetitive pattern where we're just repeating our cruise control, but we're not using our God-given talents to the best of our ability because the stress is eating away at us. Yeah. I'm not going to go into this element here on this podcast, but some of the challenges that sales organizations have in terms of giving time to their salespeople to actually sell as opposed to the administrative burdens that are put, put placed upon salespeople. I mean, it's crazy. It is. It is. A lot of organizations don't realize. I mean, I think research shows that some, you know, 20 some percent of the time is actually spent with customers. A lot of it is research, getting ready for things too, but there's that huge administrative burden. The smart organizations right now are really addressing the burden that's going on the salespeople. And, and it's kind of funny because I was at the CEB conference recently and they were talking about the sales burden and how the world-class companies are really removing as much as they can. But the salespeople are still feeling overwhelmed because the new technology they get to help the salespeople, in some cases the salespeople have to stop 
and learn how to use the new technology. And that's one more burden on them. So it's like we're in this warp period where we're just not sure how to get on top of it. And maybe it requires rethinking the sales job in organizations, you know. It, it does include leveraging technology, but technology that's so seamless that people don't even know that technology is happening. Totally agree with you. I feel like th- this last year alone, we've worked with thousands of sales reps and it, this is what they described to me, the hamster in the wheel. I'm just, we're just running, just running, just running. And you never get that moment in time to be able to sit down and you describe this in the book. The, the best thing that you could do is sit down and figure out what do I need to do to help this buyer? right? And you, you don't even get that. Like it's, it's so difficult. You're just moving, 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 moving. And you, it's very difficult to get that. Make more calls, make more calls, do more. I mean, sales is so much in many cases, an activity-based function in so many organizations where the reality is if you make fewer calls and make better calls and use your, you know, do the better research to craft more appropriate yeah. you know, gene conversations, presentations, demonstrations, you'll have a higher degree of success, but you got to stop first and you have to allow time for a salesperson to literally do that and and it has to be considered the right thing to do as opposed to you know why aren't you making more calls <laughs> why yeah. aren't you do, doing something but smart salespeople are thinking and they're taking that time to do what it takes to come up with the right approaches that'll be the most effective and more sales less time will help them with that <laughs> 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 exactly. Yeah, I feel like I'm in an, I don't know what you call it, an AA program. I'm in a drugs anonymous program here because when I read this in the book, I, it, it totally got my attention and I realized that this was me. I have an addiction problem and it's, it's, it's self-inflicted and it's happening internally that I don't even realize it. So, so first off, chill, I have a problem. That's the step first step. <laughs> And admitting, right? Explain a little bit about this neuroscience of the dopamine surge, of how we as salespeople are reacting to every little light, ring, buzz that goes off around us. Yeah, I think we have no idea that, that this is actually a, a real reaction that we're having and it's pulling us in. But our bodies are designed to pay attention to the external world and to look around and to scan the horizon and to see what's new out there. And when we actually get online or get with our devices, what happens is the amygdala, which is the oldest part of our brain, you know, that, that's protecting us, the fight and flight response, the amygdala jumps to the forefront and says, I'll take a look, I'll be in charge, you know, and it starts scanning everywhere, which is why we end up going down a rabbit hole so often. I mean, I go on to check my email, I get an email from LinkedIn, it says, here's the good articles for the day. The next thing I know, I'm reading this article, then I'm, that one leads to this and a half an hour later and bing, 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 bing. Okay, so that's all happening. And every time you do something and discover something new, your brain says, oh, good job. I'm going to give you a little dopamine because you just found something new in that environment. And then when you take a step back and you go, okay, now my body is actually made to do that. It's designed to discover this stuff. And savvy marketers out there are creating an environment where every one of us goes online and we are being pulled in and pulled in and pulled in. And so every time we go somewhere, we get a little shot of that dopamine, which is a pleasure drug. And it's like, yes, you did a good job. Yes, you did a good job. You found something new and we just crave it. We love it. And it's addictive and we want more. And what's even worse about this addiction cycle is it's worse when you don't always get rewarded, you know? So (laughs) And just think, isn't that, I got to check to see if my emails come in if that guy sent the contract yet. Oh, he hasn't checked. Oh, not yet. Okay, I'm going to look for something else and work for a couple more minutes. And I'm going to check my email again to see if that contract has come in. You know, people in the sales profession, we live in a world where we're rewarded now and then, which makes it even more highly addictive that we want it, want it, want it. And so when I realized that all this stuff was happening in the background of me and it's just the way I was wired, I went, oh my God, I had no idea. I mean, I know I get twitchy when I can't check things. Yeah. get twitchy and I get irritated and I check at stop signs sometimes, you know, and... <laughs> I feel you on that. You're like, you're like, I need to check. I need to check. And it's, it's sometimes it's, it's just out of habit, right? Like you're just doing nothing. Maybe you're even in the middle of conversation with somebody and you, all of a sudden you're, you, you're like, oh, oh. And you're looking at this just out of habit. It happens. I know. 
I know. So what I realized is that I was, I did not have the power to fight it because it's how my body is designed. So what I needed to do is to focus on finding a way to minimize it, which was a whole new venture for me in terms of how do I minimize this addiction that I have and how do I prevent myself from actually getting caught in it because I do not have enough power in the world to resist it. And you know, I think there's maybe 10% of people out there who are so freaking disciplined. I mean, they just are perfect and I hate them. Um, <laughs> I hate to say that because I'm not one of them. I mean, I'm the one who gets sucked in, you know, it's like, I can't resist. Yeah. But I just realized that I, I, I can't. And, and so I needed to create a different work environment where I wasn't being pulled away from my work at all times. And so literally little by little, I started eliminating things in my life that would cause me distraction. And that distraction leads to less time to sell. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, research shows that here's, this is a little tidbit that most emails when they come into your inbox are attended to within like six or seven seconds. Wow. I didn't realize that. Yes. Six or seven seconds. So an email comes in, you get a bing or, you know, whatever you get to signify you've got, you know, you've got mail. You got mail. <laughs> and you check it. You literally stop what you're doing to check it. Now you may not read it. You may see that it's from, you know, a newsletter, you know, from. From Mario. <laughs> oh dear. Well, I don't need to read that now. You know, but it's not the one you were looking for. So you go back, but every time you are switching your attention, you're literally wasting 30% or so of your productive time during the course of the day. So what we're doing is constantly task switching. Again, going back to neuroscience, our brain is like incapable of doing two things concurrently. It physically can't do it. So it stops, it goes over there, checks it out, and then comes back. But every time your attention leaves one thing, your brain has to get itself going again on the next thing. And then there's this uptake of time to get yourself back to the productivity level that you were at before. So again, you know, you can pick up easily one to two hours a day just by minimizing the task switching that you're doing. So let's give a practical tip that someone can use. And you laugh at me in a previous role at another company when I was working for a fortune 100, I actually had a training about how to increase sales productivity. Yeah. And the, one of the tips that I gave was this email notification pop-up, the little icon that pops up, I think it's the little mail icon in the bottom right-hand corner or the little notification window, uh, the, you know, the little rectangle that pops up. I used to train with sales folks and say, let me ask you a question. If you're not looking at email for 10, 15, 20, one minute, one hour, two hours, a whole day, will you actually be receiving email? Yes or yes? <laughs> Yes. And the yes. answer is, is, of course, as you said, right? Yes. Yes, you're going to receive it. So I would ask people, why do you need to be notified that you've got mail when you already know that you're getting mail? And we launched M3 Junior Growth Strategies here this year. I turned them on. And I literally, when I read this part of the book, I was like, what am I thinking? What is wrong with me? Turn them off. Turn oh, no. off these notifications. You, you knew. You knew it. And then... Now you're starting your own company and it's like, oh God, I've got to be there. I got to see when all this email comes in, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. But it was a great reminder, something so simple, something so easy to do. Yeah. Turn off your email notifications and reminders because what, what you describe in the book, More Sales, Less Time, is exactly what I was doing. I'd be working on something, writing an article, preparing for a proposal, really thinking about my strategy plan for a, a prospecting meeting and all, all of a sudden something pops up. And what do I do? I go click into it and I, I get distracted. And a half an hour later, and I come back. One distraction can expand. And it won't be just that one distraction down that rabbit hole you go and 20 minutes later. No doubt. And that's, a thir thir I would say 30 minutes later, 30 minutes later, I come back and I say, now what the heck was I working on? <laughs> Where was I? What, that, what idea did I just have that was, you know, so brilliant? I thought, you know, but it's gone. It can take you a full hour to get yourself back, but by then you've been distracted two or three times. And so to disconnect from the bing, bing, bings is like one of the most simple things everybody can do. And I think I read someplace that only 15% of people will actually on their cell phones change the notifications and, and eliminate them. 85% of the people just go with whatever settings come on their devices. So that brings up a good, another good point. So I turned off by the direction of your book, I turned off email notifications. 
No reminders, no pop-ups, no, I mean, I'm sorry, calendar reminders, yes, but no pop-ups, no little icons. And I think there's a lot of sales folks that get like, get this withdrawal. Like, I, I don't see the little, little envelope. You know, that little teeny weeny envelope you see in the right-hand corner? I don't see it. I don't see it. I turned it off. Jill Conrad says, turn it off. I turned it off. And then I went to the mobile device and I turned off notifications there on most of the apps. Did I do it right, Jill? Yeah, you did. <laughs> it's, it's literally about protecting your own time and saying, you know, my time is valuable and it's my greatest asset. And how I choose to use my day can either be boing, 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 kind of like a being in a you know popcorn popper or something. You know, boom, boom, boom. I'm going here and there during the course of the day, or saying I'm going to set the course of my day and I'm going to have it go the way I want it to go, which is. For those of us who are a little older, it's it's how we probably more grew up in this profession, setting our course for the day. And here's I'm going to get to the office. I'm going to make you know 15 calls, and I'm going to you know do this, and then we're working on proposals this afternoon. But once we enter that digital world, we become fodders for our our animal brain. You know, the one that's out there searching the world. And so we have to take control of it because honestly, our brain is wired to do exactly what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, this stat. CSO reports that 45%, yeah. 45% of salespeople do not make sales quota. Mm -hmm. Now, there's probably a ton of reasons why that might be the case. But I do know one thing, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Productivity, the, the inability to be able to concentrate and focus and get more time selling. So how can more sales, less time, help all of our sales and marketers and, and sales leaders, how can it help them? Well, let me just say first thing that it can do, it can easily return an extra hour or two a day at no additional cost. I mean, I think that there are a lot of people out there who are buying technology, hoping to get an hour a day for their sales forces, and they're spending tons of money and yeah. all sorts of training and costs associated with it when just simply learning how the human body works and that we're, we are human and that we can easily get an extra hour if we look at how we're going to structure our workday and how we're going to package the interruptions that are built into our day. So that's the first thing I think that really is crucial that every single person, you know, except that 10% who are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you, that's now you. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm not. I mean, this is like, I'm, I'm not, you know? So once I open the opportunity, like if I fail at all, I'm gone, yeah. you know, down that rabbit hole I go. So I really have to be diligent at all times. Well, that's the first thing that we can add significantly more time per day. But I think the other thing too, is the reality that changing how people work and, and minimizing the interruptions, we will increase the quality of their thinking, their strategic ability to prepare for and craft conversations, meetings, et cetera, presentations, so that they will be much more effective. And we can add in time for learning because there is learning that's required for much of us today you know, in terms of new markets, the technology, like I already said, sometimes things about our customers, changing dynamics, things like that. We do need to be continually learning. So it really, in a sense, can upgrade everything at the expense of nothing. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, that's the reality that we all have control over this one aspect and we're abdicating it now yeah, because we don't know. We just feel so sucked in and worn out and maxed out, you know, and that doesn't have to be. Yeah. I was uh, just uh, recently having a, a conversation, a podcast with uh, James Muir on the perfect close. And James was talking about how every meeting they walk into, they have three questions that are prepared at the end of the discussion to figure out how to advance the sale. And it made me realize as I was getting ready to prepare for this conversation that I don't take enough time, right? A tenured sales individual, someone who's been in the industry for a long time, I don't take enough time to, to write those questions down to prepare. And then I started thinking, well, why don't I do that? And then I said, it is because of the exact issue that I'm talking about with Jill. <laughs> I'm not mm -hmm. taking that time. So I think, you know, as, as I read this book here, how can it definitely help you as a, the, those that are listening? Here's what I would say. It is going to help you methodically go through and as, as Jill mentioned, get back time so that actually you can prepare better for meetings, close out your meetings, sell, right? Do the things that we need to do, which is make our quota, Right. So fantastic yeah, insights. I mean, like, I'm not a productivity geek. I mean, to me, that's not what it's all about. To me, it's all about selling. 
And all this kind of stuff I'm talking about is to encourage more effective selling with higher results. I mean, literally, it's about getting more sales in less time. Yeah, totally agree with you. And hopefully bringing down that stat, I was like, it was astounding. 45% of salespeople don't make their sales quota. Like there's, that's a serious problem. Something is wrong there. <laughs> Something is seriously wrong. Three things, three things you want our sales community to walk away with from this book. You kind of touched on a couple things, but what do you want them to walk away with if for this book? I want them to realize that time is their most valuable asset. It, it truly is their most valuable asset. And if they don't go into the day thinking about it, they will go into the day getting sucked into the problems that emerge and getting sucked into things that don't contribute to the maximum use of their day. I mean, this is about optimizing yourself so that you can do it. Um, the second thing I, I want people to take from it is that I really believe that everybody needs to start experimenting with different things and try new things. I mean, throughout the book, I've given a ton of different experiments. Try this, try that. And I was an experiment throughout the whole book. You can read all this stuff, but you have to put it into practice and you have to put it into practice in your life in an experimental mode. Let me try it. Let me try it for a couple of weeks to see how this works and can I integrate this into my workflow? And I think to me, sales has always been an experiment. And I'm, and I'm not just talking about the time stuff, you know, like what is the best way to, to get somebody to answer your phone call? What's the yeah. best way to email return? There is no one best way. Everything you look at, there are ways to make it better. Life is an experiment. And so I would encourage people to experiment. And there's a ton of different experiments in there that can help them find a way that might be better for them. Very good. Practical tips. We talked about one of them. Turn off the notifications on your email. Give us three things, maybe three new things that you want our sales community to stop doing right now so that they can be better at and you fill in the blank. Stop checking email the first thing you do when you come into your office. Stop. Good. Why? Uh, why? Because once you do that, you're gone and you have now entered other people's priorities. So what you really need to be doing is come into your office and sit down quietly and say, I've got a lot of stuff going on today. What's the most effective use of my time? What do I really need to get done? Of all these opportunities that I have, which is the one I really should be working on today? Yeah. And to really stop and think strategically before you move forward. That in itself is, is very powerful. And it's very calming because you don't do it. Another thing I think is crucial is time blocking and literally putting time on your calendar for different tasks, not to leave your calendar wide open. I used to leave it wide open. And so you'd look at my calendar and, you know, there'd be blank space and here's a meeting, blank space and meeting. Now I work in, in this blank space would be prep, you know, everything would be filled in so that my day didn't just happen, happen. and evolve I knew I would know that from 10 to 11, I was reviewing the, the case studies that my client sent me. And then, then I'd take a, a break and then I, would, then I would move into, okay, how can I take this? And what are the key points I want to focus on an upcoming keynote? I mean, to me, it's like, this is what the first hour is. This is what the second hour is. And it's not just a whole day, prepare, prepare for keynote. It's boom, boom, boom in one hour time sections. Yeah. That uh, forces me to, stay in the mode. Otherwise I get lost. Yeah. That, so I'd say that that, you know, just stop filling in your calendar, hit and miss on what you actually have doing it, block in your prep time, block in your research time, block in your LinkedIn time, block in your, you know, your email time, block in your email time and say, I'm going to check email at 8 30, 10 30 noon, you know, whatever it is. And then stay on that. So just to, just to re repeat what you said, stop checking email and plan your day when you first come in in the morning. Yeah, I cannot disagree with you. That, that is a fantastic tip in terms of controlling what it is that you need to do that's most important to make quota. <laughs> you talked about time blocking. And what you, what I think what you suggested is, is stop letting your day happen. Yes. Plan your day, right? So this is that, so having that time blocking. And by the way, I took that and I started blocking out chunks of time on my calendar because my calendar is public on m3junior.com. As you know, you can schedule a meeting and that's a fantastic tool, but everybody has access to it. <laughs> and then your day is interrupted based on who wants to meet with you now. But so now you can fill in that the morning is busy because you're doing this exactly. and your time is valuable. Your time is valuable. 
Exactly right. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So I think those are fantastic tips that, that people can glean. Go ahead. One more. One more that I want to share. Yeah, I really did not understand the power of taking breaks. And for me, that was, I'm sort of a, a slave master, you know, I mean, I'll drive myself, to, I got to keep at it and keep going. And, and I think a lot of people who are achievers are like that. Yeah. But research into optimal brain power, you know, I mean, where are you at your best? And again, I'm not just talking about maximizing productivity. I'm talking about being the best salesperson that you can be. The research shows that the people who are the best at it take regular breaks. They literally get up after a period of time. And I think one group, um, their research showed 50, the top performers in their organization were 52 minutes, and then they take 17 minute breaks, 17 minute breaks, enough time to leave their desk, not to go on social media. Because by the way, that is not good for the brain that sucks you in and does not give you the refreshment that you need, but literally to get up, to move around, to get on that machine that's behind you. I was just about to say, you mean, that's my advice from Jill Conrad. I better, that, that thing, I think it's, uh, I, I don't even know if it works. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It works. <laughs> Well, see, I had to get mine primed up. I'm in Minnesota right now, and it is, like, really cold. Yeah. And so I usually go out and take, you know, I'll walk for a mile during the, the middle of the day just to take a break. And honestly, what happens, especially if you've got a naughty problem that you're working on, you know, you're working on, you're thinking, I don't know what to do with this particular client. They're driving me nuts. And you get up, you leave your desk, you go for a walk, and it loosens up your brain, and your brain literally starts connecting different ways. And by the time you come back, you'll have a fresh approach that wouldn't have been there. And all breaks are good for the brain because the brain is a muscle, and it needs you to stop now and then if you want to be at your optimum processing power. Those are fantastic, three fantastic tips. And for those listeners who are not watching a video, uh, behind me, Jill's referring to wow. a treadmill that should be used <laughs> a lot more often. So I'm actually today, I'm going to take a 15 minute break and I'm going to commit to do two 15 minute breaks, Jill. You're my accountability partner on this. I'm going to send you an email at the end of the day and say 15 minute breaks on the machine. I ran done. So I'm letting you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow you as my accountability partner. Is that all right? That's really good. And by the way, you'll feel better and you'll, and then you don't have to think about having to exercise after work because you've already done stuff during work and it's actually helped you be better at your job. Most yeah. people don't realize that. They just think they have to work out later, but there's no reason you can't move during the day and get something going. You're darn right at that. That's for sure. Because I know that uh, I'm going to, I'm about to hit 40. And oh I have a lot of aches and pains and kinks that are coming around. No. <laughs> I'm way too young for that. <laughs> way too young for that. <laughs> I love it. Something into more of a, just a general uh, question for you, my friend. For those that are just starting out in sales, new folks, what advice would you give them on how to be the most productive? And I think you gave three things. It may be those repeating those three things and saying that, but, but new folks, they, a lot of new folks are trained by the old timers. And I'm not saying old timers as in people that are old, but people that have been in the organization for X period of time, right? And some of these bad habits that the folks who have been tenured selling roll off to the new folks. We've got a new guy working. What do you tell the new guy or gal? I would tell, and this doesn't really have to do anything with productivity right now, because to me, the most important thing that any new hire can do is understand their customer in excruciating detail and depth. They need to know who are we calling on, you know, what are their positions, what are their challenges, what are their issues, concerns, what are their roles and responsibilities, what's a typical day in the life like, how are they currently doing things related to the status quo, what is their status quo related to our product or service offering. That knowledge is the foundation for all of selling. And in most organizations, I see them saying, here, you got to learn everything about what we're selling. Here's our product details. Here's our service overview. But they don't stop and teach them about the customer. So they can't do good selling because they're more into pitch mode, which is yeah. let's tell them about this stuff. But the reality is sales is about a conversation. Yeah. And you can't have a conversation with any gravitas if you don't have the knowledge to do it. So. To me, my advice is learn the customer. And I'm actually going to integrate this for you because I, this is the beauty about having a live podcast here where you, I don't know what you're going to say, but what you yeah. just said cannot happen if you are not focused and taking the time, time to learn 
what it is that your buyer needs, how you can help them learn more about the customer. So I would argue, my friend, that more sales, less time is going to help somebody as a newbie coming into an organization to take a step back. You're going to have it be thrown at you, all the product information. Great. But the most important thing is who's your customer? What is it all about? As you said, and figure out how you can actually sell to them. So value your time. That's what I got out of more sales, less time. Value your time. Let me just say, I did write a book for new salespeople. <laughs> you okay. Aware of that. It's called agile selling. That's right. How to get up to speed fast in a new sales position. And it's really very much focused on, you know, don't buy into, you know, here's everything, you know, go get them buster or go, go hang out with the old farts who've been around here forever and learn what they do. I mean, they, what they know is so deep. And so they can't tell you what a new salesperson has to know. And they always have the best accounts and they're not starting from scratch with the crummy ones, you know, so the new sales guy or gal has to learn different stuff and they, really can learn it. They have to take control of their learning because most sales organizations don't have great sales training. They just throw salespeople in there and it's kind of a sink or swim. I mean, some of them have some training, but none of them have enough, if you want my honest opinion. And that is a value to the salesperson to connect with their buyers and have valuable conversations with their buyers. I agree with you on that one. One thing I really loved about the book, I know we're coming short on time here. One thing I really loved about your book, and you mentioned this earlier, is the challenges that you threw out. I think it's almost in every chapter, if I'm not mistaken. There's a challenge in every chapter. Just about, yeah. Just about. Not everyone, but just about. And it was the concept of experimentation, right? Like what works for you? I loved it because it allowed me at the end of, as I read through the science and the methodology and the challenges and the issues, and and it really related to me. Then I got to the challenges and I was like, all right, I've got a task. I've got a task. I've got to try something. Give us one challenge from the book right now that every listener must do or should practice or should try to be more productive and more successful. All right, here's one challenge. I, I, and I don't know if it's actually a challenge in the book, but it's related to it. But uh, Rescue Time is a good app that people can download. And there's a free version and there's a really cheap version. But it runs in the background. I mean, one of the things that's in sales they tell you is, or in productivity is they tell you to track your time and to figure out where you're wasting your time. Well, I tried that, didn't work. I mean, I was jumping around so often I couldn't, I was spending more time trying to write down what I was doing. It was like I was a failure at it. But I discovered Rescue Time, which was working in the background on my devices, and it was telling me how my time was being spent. It was the biggest eye-opener of anything I've done. It was like, I don't even want to tell you how bad my statistics were. I mean, it was so embarrassingly bad that, you know, it's like, it's a wake-up call. I needed to go, oh my God, Jill, look what you are doing. No yeah. wonder you're having trouble. And that's a challenge. You can try it in the background. You can get it you know, on a test, free download test and do it, but it's rescue time. Love it. So uh, for all of those listening out there, we'll put rescue time into the show notes so that they have an opportunity to be able to figure out where to go for that. But so that's a great, fantastic piece of advice because as Jill mentioned, and even in the book, it really highlighted what you're doing and it helps you see like, shoot, I spent 45 minutes playing on social media. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you were researching. I don't know, but, but it really can help bring perspective into what you're doing. And I love that about the book. You uh, mentioned this earlier about at a very minimum, more sales, less time, doing some of the things that, that people uh, can implement from your book will give you a minimum one to two hours back to your day. Tell us though, what has been your personal results? You, I mean, you have gone from this end to this end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, trying to bring in more productivity and it's a, learn, it's a, it's a work in progress, right? But tell us your personal results. You've implemented a lot of these practices. You've got probably a system down. How much time did you really get back into your day? Well, my goal is to work 30 hours. I love it. And to earn the same income. I mean, I think everybody is at a different point in their career. So, that's what I was working toward. I personally had some family challenges this past year with health issues of other members. And I was working a lot less than 30 hours for many weeks in there just because of the nature of what was happening in my personal life. And, and honestly, I just did my taxes. And I mean, I'm astounded that I was able to keep my income at a reasonable level, even when being out of commission so much during the course of the year. Because you're brilliant. That's why. (laughs) I would say brilliant is probably the hundred, you know, the major reason. But the reality is I 
was able to, when I came in and was able to be working, I was really productive and got a lot more and I was able to attend to the other things in my life. Yeah. So what has it done? I mean, I, it allowed me to deal with the chaos in my personal life and keep my work going at the same time. I mean, that's one thing. Um, moving forward, things are a little different now. So I'm really looking forward to having a lot more fun because I'm going to get my work done faster. So I have a life, like a real life. That's what I'm really, really looking forward to right now. That's awesome. I love it. If someone wants to connect with you, Jill, reach out to you, ask you any questions. What's the best way for them to contact you? Jill at jillconrath.com. On LinkedIn? Conrath with a K. I, no, LinkedIn's got a clunky interface for emailing people. Sorry. And they, they could follow you though on LinkedIn for sure. Yeah, yes. Like I have like almost 275,000 followers on LinkedIn. So people can follow me. I get so, I get hit up so much on LinkedIn that email communications in mail and stuff just dries up. So the best way is just right to my inbox. Okay. Which I will check several times a day, but not all the time. I love it. And your Twitter handle. Can people follow you on Twitter? They can. At Jill Conrath. At Jill Conrath. I love it. Uh, more sales, uh, less time is honestly, it's a perfect book to kick off 2017. Everybody walks into the new year with talking about how, what they want to do differently. And I love the book. Thank you for sharing with me. My wife wondered why we were at the beach the whole time in December and I was with my iPad. I was married with my iPad. I kept telling her, it's not because I'm working. I'm really not. She's like, you're not supposed to work. You're not. I'm like, well, I'm not. I'm actually, I'm actually reading. <laughs> so where can our listeners get a copy of More Sales, Less Time? It's kind of everywhere right now, I think. You know, it's at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookstores. It's everywhere. So easily go look it up on Amazon. We'll put a link into uh, the show notes as well so that people can uh, take a look there. Jill, it's always, my friend, a pleasure spending time with you, talking with you. As I mentioned earlier, you have been iconic in the sales industry. Oh, wow. <laughs> and to have you as a guest on the show has just been uh, an awesome privilege. And I think anybody who is listening to this, they need to go out there and grab a hold of the book because this problem that we are speaking to right now, being able to have more selling time to make quota, but as well as get personal life back, right? I mean, like just give us some, some balance back into our lives. This is one of the few and only books that I personally have read. And quite frankly, material that's out there for the sales community. It actually made me think about like, what could I start writing about to help people get balance back into their life? Cause we don't even publish that. So this is fantastic. I loved having you on the show today. You are awesome and amazing and thank you. And I hope to have you back again soon. Thank you much. Thanks for listening to the Selling with Social podcast. I'm super pumped that you are our guest today. Here's what I want you to do right now. Go to m, the number three, jr.com forward slash podcast and support our podcast, please, by distributing it out anywhere you can get it to on social. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll find all the instructions there on the site on how to subscribe to the Selling with Social podcast. Until the next show, keep on rocking. Mario Martinez Jr., out.